All right, so um, again, I'm Kristen Lilvis. I'm an associate professor, professor at Marshall University, and I direct our digital humanities program. And until this year, I also directed our grad program. So I'd be happy to talk just with you also about strategies for job market and things like that, because I have worked with every single student we had. Um, and now I continue. I also um, am a faculty in residence, so I live in a residence hall on campus. And so every student in like a six dorm radius comes to me with a CV and resume. So that is my, my unpaid side gig. <laughs> it is surprisingly kind of fun. So, um, so this session is about innovating in the humanities and I'll run through some of what I have planned. The people who are here, I think you fit really well with what I'm talking about, but um, please feel free, like if you wanna stop me and ask a question, and I'm gonna leave plenty of time anyway so that we can kind of just chat, but this doesn't have to go in some strict form, so. Um, oops. Yes. <laughs> so when I'm saying why innovate, I'm always kind of starting with the digital humanities because that's my particular thing. And it, isn't, it doesn't have to just be digital humanities, but for me, innovating in the humanities started there in mm. that the digital humanities, which I define very broadly as anything that brings technology and the arts and the humanities together. So looking at how technology can help us answer questions about what it means to be human. Um, it has been really useful for helping me innovate because it has put me into contact with people in other departments and colleges and also universities. So I've done several things with Ohio University because of digital humanities. And that has brought me to some things that have been really influential to my scholarship. So one, it's helped me identify new scholarly interests. So because of my work in the digital humanities, I started out in contemporary literature, and particularly contemporary African American literature. I'm now working on a major grant project that relates to uh, recovery from substance use disorders in Appalachia. And there are ways that that's really connected to some of the contemporary literature work that I've been doing, but mostly it has come out of collaborating with people in other departments who wanted to talk to me about DH tools and techniques and who I could learn from about those things. Um, the other thing, and I'd be happy to talk, I have a case study at the bottom, but we can talk more about that too. The other thing that I think innovating in the humanities does, and particularly if you can get that term digital humanities in there, is that it does appeal to hiring and admission committees. So this article on the left is from the Chronicle in 2017, and it's talking about the DH boom in the academic job market. And if you've been looking at the job lists, have you started looking yet, Sean? Okay, yeah, and you're still a little early for looking. I would not look until you have to. <laughs> Don't start yet. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun. Um, but I think one thing that innovating does, it is allows you ways to think about different types of jobs you can apply for that still are actually jobs suited to you. So I know when I was coming out of grad school, I could apply for American Lit, and African American lit jobs. And I could maybe apply for a women's studies job because I do mostly women's literature. But that was still, those are kind of closely related, right? The best job I was gonna get was gonna be a job that wanted somebody who did African American women's literature, which is there, right? That job exists. Now, because I've been doing stuff with digital humanities, one, I can apply to jobs that are just asking for DH and surprisingly, you don't need to have all that much DH experience to be relevant for those jobs. Um, so thinking about doing work with video games, you already can apply for a lot of those jobs. With some of your work with Emily Dickinson, I can think of lots of ways that you could do digital text analysis, like natural language processing stuff that we could talk about, that if you did one project with that, you would be qualified to apply for a digital humanities job. And I like that because, this, as this Chronicle article is saying, it is one of the places in the academic job market that has seen a little bit of growth. And I know for a while, when you looked, it was pretty grim. Um, I'm not saying this year is still necessarily a great year. And DH, there's also a thousand articles you'll find where people are like, eh, 
it's a, it's a fad. Yeah, it's a fad, maybe, but people are still hiring in it. And if we think about where the world is going and where the academic job market is going, it, it's going to continue. The one on the right is an article from actually the Harvard Business Review, and it's talking about uh, Silicon Valley and the Pentagon and how they're looking for critical thinkers. And not that I think everybody in the humanities needs to necessarily leave and go into the business world, but it is shocking what opens up if you do some of this innovation and collaboration. So for example, I was on a team that had a challenge from Intuit, if you've heard of like the TurboTax company. So they did a challenge at Marshall University for us to come up with creative solutions to big problems. And our team came up with a, uh, a, a vi virtual reality product to help deal with substance uh, use disorders. And I was working with students and faculty in business, in engineering, um, communication studies. And we won this challenge and <laughs> we were flown out to California and we went to Google and we went to Facebook and we had meetings with the top people at Intuit. And if you had ever told me <laughs> that I was gonna go have a face-to-face -face meeting with the guy who runs into it, I would have said that's not going to happen, right? But because somebody's like, hey, you'd be a good fit in helping the people on this team think about research questions, I got to learn from all of them and get some of these contacts that I otherwise wouldn't have had. And I will say when I went, as this article is talking about, one of the things they kept saying again and again is we want people who can think critically and who can write. So if you have those skills because you're in the humanities, that really does transfer. But making connections with people in other disciplines while you're a grad student is useful because then you have people in other disciplines to vouch for you. Because if I just say to somebody in business, I promise I can write and crick think critically, but if I don't know what your world is like, you're not going to hire me. But like if Brad Smith would be like, hey, I'm, I've met her on multiple occasions, right, that's going to go a long way. Um, the other thing that I think innovating really does is it allows you to practice new strategies for developing, presenting, and publishing your research. Now when I do a presentation, I build a website every time. It's an Adobe Spark website. It takes no longer than to do a PowerPoint, but I have these saved. I can link them on my professional website. I can link them on my digital humanities site that I run for Marshall, and automatically everything I do looks that much more professional. And really this takes me 15 minutes to do. And so I think that's something that's a plus. It also lets me break out of traditional ways of presenting that if you've been especially to an academic conference in English, we are the worst people in the world at that. All we do is stand up there and read a paper. It is so boring. But even if I'm just gonna stand up there and read the paper, if, if I could direct my audience to here's a website you could scroll through while I'm reading, right? Or here's a persistent link other than a Google Doc where you can find this information beyond, I think that can be kind of useful. Um, also, from my digital humanities work, I have done a major research project on pinball <laughs> machines, um, which I just mentioned because it's cool. But I got to go to Rutgers University and present on that in a really non-traditional sort of academic thing. Um, yeah, there's been, there have been a lot of opportunities to get outside of a traditional going to MLA or going to one of the big conferences and going to these other places. I've also done some publishing on um, writing and teaching students in STEM courses how to write. And if you look at journals that are focused on teaching, they're very exciting if you're do excited about collaborations across discipline lines. And so that's something I've been able to do. And then, like I said, finding potential collaborators and colleagues, and this really can easily start in grad school. You have to be careful that you're not putting yourself so out there that you're getting burdened with doing a million things. But I do think there are ways you can do various things. And I'll give you this link later. But it talks a little bit about um, the game studies um, presentation that I did, like I said, on, on pinball machines. Um, I've been working with somebody who's doing work on sermon studies and stylometry. And this is in some ways could be interesting related to Emily Dickinson. Have you done anything with stylometry before? 
It's, it's basically you can attribute an author to text that you don't know if the author wrote or not, or you can find out specific things about an author's style through these different programs, and it's kind of cool. So for example, I have a colleague who works with in Whitman Studies, and there are some unsigned documents that people have thought were written by Walt Whitman, and they can, by running them through this program, go, yeah, they actually very likely were, like 99% likelihood Walt Whitman actually <coughs> wrote this, even if we didn't know. It's also really cool if a text is collaboratively written, you can actually see which parts were by one author and which were by another, and that's kind of a fun thing. Do they use that on Shakespeare? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's, I think, really fun. And these are things that can be kind of complicated, but also they aren't terribly. And this is an easy way to collaborate. As soon as you're interested in something like that, you can talk to people in other departments and colleges and say, so I have this research idea I'd like to do. You have the technical abilities. Let's work together on that. We could jointly do a presentation or jointly do a publication. And that's going to be something that's a lot of interest to an audience, but also useful for you and to that other person. I'm team teaching a class right now on coding in the digital humanities. Do you know how much code I know? Essentially zero. <laughs> um, so for that portion of the class, I sit and I'm learning Python with my students, but I'm helping them develop research questions that we can use Python to answer. And so it's been really great for me and my collaborating teacher who's in computer science, um, but it's also giving me new ideas for my research. There's a couple other things on there. The gadgetry, this second to last button, this comes from a conference that I went to and Grant Winthoff, who's a scholar, he's working on a book for a general audience about the history of gadgets and really like looking at when that word gadget came into use and how it's changed over time. And he's doing it and through a digital publishing platform, which is a new thing that's out there that is growing and that I think is something that if I were a grad student I would try to take advantage of because I know as a faculty member <laughs> I am now, uh, especially if you're doing something with game studies and to think about that being published in a flat like journal that isn't interactive, right, or a book that isn't inter interactive is a loss to what you're talking about. So if you can do some of these online publishing platforms that are affiliated with the university, it is a major publication, but it allows you to have a little bit more interactivity there. And another example of that is Torn Apart slash Separados. And so this author, um, one of the authors of this project was just here at Ohio University for that camp which is a digital humanities unconference, and she talked about this mapping project and all of the different people who came together to work on this and again collaborating across discipline lines. And so just my, one of my kind of final notes is you want to be flexible and multifaceted but not fickle. So when I'm looking at my CV, I see that I've moved from a print publication on African American women's mostly print literature to now I'm doing this digital humanities project. I need to make sure that I can clearly communicate how those things are linked and how I got from one to the other. Because I don't want my whole first half of my career to be something that I'm like, oh, that's what I used to do, but now I'm doing this. I need to talk about how those things are united. So even when we were just chatting before this, I said, oh yeah, it was mostly African American women's print literature, but I also looked at film and music videos and art, right? So I'm setting myself up as always being looking at multimedia, and now I'm just doing that in a new way, so I can create that thread. And that's something that I would recommend as you're going on the job market in the humanities, thinking about that thread that you can, you can connect. And the last thing on there is just talking about my particular project I'm working on right now, the uh, collaborative project about narratives of recovery. And it's a mapping project, and so we have faculty and staff at Marshall in English, geography, digital humanities, addiction studies, and our wellness program. I've also talked about collaborating with people at other universities. And we have funding sources that range from state humanities councils to um, government innovation grants to potentially NEH and NSF grants. And so that idea of innovating has opened me up really to a lot of different funding opportunities, which is a major bonus too. So what questions can I answer for you or, or anything you can tell me about what you're doing in particular that maybe 
I could provide a perspective on. Sean, because you're farther along, I can pick on you for a second. <laughs> How are you marketing yourself right now on the, on the job market? Well, I mean, I'm mostly looking to go to a teaching-focused university as opposed to, say, a research-based university. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the main things I'm doing is actually milking my contacts. Um, I I'm, have developed close relationships with department heads and ad my advisors over the course of my three-step Mm -hmm. undergrad, master's, and PhD, and I'm kind of um, making sure that I'm keeping up with them, telling them what I'm doing, asking them if they know anyone, and I'm, I'm kind of doing a lot of schmoozing. That's good. When you think about, like, your cover letter, mm -hmm. are you selling yourself as, like, rec comp primarily? Yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, rec comp positions, um, they're both more marketable and also in higher demand. Sure. What are your secondary areas, if you have those? <coughs> Rhetoric of composition and uh, digital humanities, multimodality. Okay. Um, that sort of thing. I mean, I can teach. I have a master's in English Lit, and my focus was uh, rec comp and um, classical rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So I can teach. Uh, I, could, I could teach Shakespeare. I t I've, I've done papers on Shakespeare before. I could, I could teach Elizabethan um, plays. Uh, I could also teach. Yeah. Uh, like uh, talking about like ancient Greek writing and you know I'm intimately familiar with rhetoric by Aristotle sure. and with, with Plato's stuff and all of the dialogues and all that. I, I think that's all important stuff to think about when you are going on that market because I've been on, I've chaired or been on probably at least half a dozen <coughs> search committees since I've been at Marshall. So I have obviously been on the job market and now I'm on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And I know that really now if you're looking at the ads, it, they are going to ask you to do one thing and especially at a teaching school, they're going to say, and we also want you to do five of these 15 other things because departments are getting funding cut off and, and so I might only get one hired to replace say three, three people. They want to know how many holes you Yes. And so that's the thing I think about being multifaceted but not fickle um, is really key. So I have to make a case that I can teach these multiple other things, but I have to make sure that they understand that I'm not just reading their ad and saying every single word that they <laughs> have asked me to fill in. But I have to really make a case that I could do it. And so when you said you've written a paper on Shakespeare, mm -hmm. have you published it or presented on it? I presented That's good though, right? Because so I know when I'm on these committees, if I'm reading this and one of the side areas said Shakespeare and you said you could do it, I'm going to read your letter and it's going to be basically alongside your CV and I'm going to go, can he really do it? Yep, there it is, yeah. right? There he did, it, he did a presentation. And so that's going to make a big deal that there is evidence on that, on that CV. And I think milking your contacts is good, but mm -hmm. if that person you're in contact with isn't on that search committee, it only goes so far because if I'm looking at 100 or 200 applications, unfortunately the first thing I'm doing is to look who I can cut out because that makes my job easier. So who can do, who can fill a few holes, but more than you can fill every hole, who can fill a few of them really well? It's, it, yeah, it's less that I'm seeing if they're on the committee and more asking them who they know and who they can introduce me to and then befriending them and asking them who they know and yeah. who they feel comfortable introducing me to. And it's kind of like building that sort of network. Yeah. Yeah. I think that helps a lot. Um, I think definitely as you're going along, work with your graduate college and work with your department on the job letter because the the number one thing that when we're making hiring decisions that I look at is the job letter and your CV. And I look at your recommendations if I've already decided you're not automatically excluded from those two things, right? If I look at those two things and I'm like, eh, I don't know, I don't think so, I'm not even going to read your recs. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to look at your writing sample because that, those things take me a lot of time. 
but to just look at that letter is pretty quick. And so I think looking at how you can in that letter and how you can in, in your CV show that you fill those multiple areas, that you can innovate, right, that you can make connections is really key. I love the three minute thesis competition because I think not only is it the elevator pitch when you're at the job market, but also that's practice for how you can write in four sentences what you've spent seven years doing, right. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple really easy ways you can do text analysis with digital tools. Mm -hmm. So one with the natural language processing, some of that's a little bit more sophisticated, but an easy, a really easy tool you can go to is um, Voyant um, hyphen tools or dash tool hyphen tools dot org. And with this tool, you can paste in a text or a book, or in fact, multiple books. So I do this with my students with every Harry Potter book. And we paste all, or rather we upload all seven books, full text. And when I hit reveal, what it will do is it's gonna show patterns in language. It's gonna show most common words. It's gonna do just some really cool, sort of basic, but also really sophisticated analysis. And an example I often show a, a friend I went to um, grad school with, he uses Voyant tools and he published a book called the Jay-Z Mixtape. This is an online publication but an online academic publication so it is associated with an academic press. Mm -hmm. This is in Scalar, I think, which is a really um, a common on online medium right now. The other big one is called Mallet that people seem to, to use, or um, it's not Mallet, sorry, I'll think of it in a second. But what he has in this book is you can see visualizations where he's analyzing word usage, for example. And so, He's, here he's looking at personal pronouns, so how often Jay-Z, you know, says I, for example. And we get this interesting graphic, and he's using another graph or software program to get his graphics, but he's doing all of his analysis through Voyant, which is this free online program that you can do. And it's providing something that he's able to publish in a way that is much more interesting. He's received major um, grants for this work that he's doing because he's in this innovative field. Um, we can see it's still, you know, the type of academic analysis that we're familiar with, but using these programs, he's able to get at him through this, this information data way. Yeah, and, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Bad, bad language, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, we can see some of these patterns that are possible there. And this is just one example. The uh, natural language processing um, and the stylometry, there's a couple ways you can do that. Natural language processing, Stanford has a toolkit that you can work with, which does require knowing a little bit of code. Um, and the stylometry, that part I don't know quite as much about, um, but there are ways you don't have to have a lot of technical abilities and you can get into it. Yeah. And I think we only have about a minute because I have a, the instructions to hard stop at 125. Well, thank you for being here. And I have, I'll give you a card in case you have uh, questions. And specifically, if you do have additional questions about the DH stuff, send me an email because I can look it up and get back to you more quickly than I can recall it all. Yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>